We're in this series called 50 Days of Hope. And we've been looking at the 50 days between the resurrection of Jesus and the coming of the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus, after he resurrected, he was on earth for 40 days, and then he ascended back to heaven. And then he told his disciples to go to Jerusalem and to wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit, the promise of the Holy Spirit. And they waited for 10 days, and they were praying, and they were together, and um, they worshiped, and, and then the Spirit of God fell, and the church started. And so the question then is this, why did God have Jesus and the disciples, the apostles, to wait? You ever think about that? Why didn't Jesus, after he resurrected from the grave, high five a few people, say, yeah, I told you so, I'm alive, and then go back to heaven? Why didn't he do it that same day? Why did he have to wait for 40 days? Days. Well, I believe we've been answering that question because we've been looking at the things that we call 50 days of hope, the hope that God has brought to us because of what Jesus did. And we're going to be talking in the next couple of weeks about that Jesus came to help us believe, to increase our faith, to help us. That's going to be a real helpful message. I hope you'll invite somebody. But today, we're going to teach you this uh, thought, what God teaches you through waiting, through waiting. Now, I know that everybody in this room loves to wait. Anybody? Anybody love to wait? Can I get an amen if you love to wait? Nobody likes waiting. Nobody likes waiting. We all are impatient. Some are more impatient than others. My dad used to say, well, years ago, if people missed the train, it didn't matter because there would be another one coming through next month. And now if we miss the stoplight, we want to shoot somebody. That's how impatient we are. We hate waiting. But God will teach you some things through waiting that you cannot learn any other way. There are times that it seems like God is not answering our prayers, but what he is doing is he's teaching us through waiting. There are times when it feels like that God has kind of left us alone to fend for ourselves, but what he is doing is he is teaching us some valuable lessons by waiting. Nobody likes to wait. Everybody has to wait. And so the question is not that you wait, because you're going to wait on some things. But the question is, how do you wait? It's not that you wait. It's how you wait that matters and will help you in your relationship with God. Let me just give you an example about waiting poorly and then an example about waiting well. What we want for you is to learn how to wait well. Now, the waiting poorly example. Kim and I, we have three adult children, Brittany, Brandon, and Brooke, and uh, we went to see Brittany uh, a month or so ago it was around her birthday. We were going to go out for a birthday celebration. We were celebrating some stuff that she had done at work, getting some promotions and so forth. We were very excited about it. And so she lives up on the north side. So we drove up on the north side, and we decided that we were going to go out and celebrate at a nice restaurant. I'm not going to call the name of the restaurant. You would know it, and it's not McDonald's, okay, so, um, or Chick-fil-A. Uh, but we, went to the, we were going to go to this nice restaurant. So I called up. And I said, do we need a reservation? It was lunchtime. It wasn't even in the evening. I said, do we need a reservation? They said, no, just show up. Shouldn't be a long wait. You show up, we'll get you seated, and we'll serve you and everything will be great. So we showed up, and uh, we were told that it was going to be a little bit of a wait. Now, a little bit of a wait, I guess it depends on who is defining what it means by a little bit of a wait. After about 15 minutes, I went back up to the maitre d' there, the person at the little stand that gets you seated. I said, how much longer is it going to be? And she says, oh, at least 45 more minutes. I said, you're kidding me. I thought you said it wasn't going to be much of a wait. She said, well, going to be about another 45 minutes. So I went up several times during that. Is there, is there any way we can get in? We're starving. 
After about an hour and 20 minutes, we finally got to our seat, and it was over two hours before we actually got our food. Not from the time we got our seat, but from the time we were there, it was about two hours. And folks, listen, I've eaten at this restaurant before. The food is delicious. It is worth waiting for. I'm not sure it's worth waiting for two hours for it, but we waited for about two hours before we got our food. I was so upset, so bothered by this that I did not even enjoy this meal that I paid for that cost me a lot of money. Uh, I I don't know, maybe the price of it uh, also took my appetite away from me as well. But the truth is, I waited poorly. I was frustrated. I got angry at the people there. I did not enjoy the meal. In fact, after waiting that long, how dumb is it not even to enjoy what you eat? But you know what? There are many of us, when it comes to waiting, waiting on God, we're the same way. We get a sour taste in our mouth. We get frustrated about things. And we don't enjoy the life that God has blessed us so richly with. Now, that was waiting poorly. There's another time that I waited well. Um, A number of years ago, I spoke at a pastor's conference in Cuernavaca, Mexico. I don't know if you've ever been there or not, but it's south of Mexico City by about 45 minutes to an hour, and it's called the City of Eternal Spring, a beautiful, beautiful place. In fact, the hotels do not have heat or air conditioning. It's not because they can't afford it. It's because they don't need it. The city of eternal spring. On average, the high is about 75 during the day. And on average, year round, uh, the low is about 65 at night. It is a beautiful, gorgeous city. Well, while we were there, uh, the pastor of the church there had arranged for a group of us to go to this restaurant. Now, this restaurant at the time, I don't know if it is still now or not, but at the time was ranked in the top 10 restaurants in the world, not in Cuernavaca, Mexico, but in the world. And so I was very excited about going to this restaurant and to see the experience. Well, we pulled up on the outside, it didn't look like much. It looked like all the other buildings. I thought, wow, this is, uh, uh, this, I don't know what kind of experience this is gonna be. But when we came inside, uh, it was gorgeous. The, the decor was beautiful and on the inner part of the building, they had a courtyard, and it was open. And so we went in, and this lawn on the inside of this building, open to the sky, that had grass that looked like a putting green on a golf course. It was manicured and so beautiful. And they had these exotic trees and exotic flowers. The colors were just so vivid and so beautiful. And they had these exotic birds walking around. We literally, and I'm not making this up, this sounds funny, but we literally could reach out and pet a peacock. If you've ever wanted to pet a peacock, you could do it at this restaurant. It was amazing. And what they did is they took us into this inner courtyard and they told us that they were going to take our order and what we were going to do was wait in this courtyard until our meal was ready. And as soon as our meal was ready, they would call us and they would seat us at our table. Well, I thought, well, this is gonna be interesting. And they brought out a handwritten menu on this big chalkboard, and uh, we ordered our meal. And after we ordered, they began to bring all kinds of hors d'oeuvres. They began to bring drinks to us. We didn't even order these things. They just began to bring them to us and give them to us as a part of our meal. And we sat there, and you had these chairs that you could either sit upright in, or you could literally lounge. If you wanted to lay down and take a nap while you were waiting on lunch, you could. It was amazing. And we ate all these hors d'oeuvres and had all these beautiful drinks while we were waiting. And after a while, the waiter came to us, and he said, your meal is now ready. And we went, and all of us sat down at this table, And they immediately, as soon as we sat down, served our meal. It was hot. It was gorgeous. It was beautiful. And one of the top meals I've ever eaten in my life. 
Do you know that we also waited well over an hour for our food at that restaurant? But the difference was at the one a few moments ago or a few months ago, I waited poorly. I was upset. I was frustrated. I, I got mad, angry. I was, I was so frustrated that I didn't even enjoy the meal. But when I waited well at this restaurant in Cuernavaca, Mexico, it was one of the top eating experiences of my life. And you can tell by looking at me, I've had a lot of eating experiences. Now, what was the difference? Well, at one, I waited poorly. And at the other, I waited well. And I believe what God wants you to learn today is how to wait well. It'll make the difference between a frustrated Christian life and a fulfilled Christian life. I'm going to read a couple passages to you today. We're taking this entire sermon series, uh, these 50 days from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the last chapter, the last two chapters, I'm sorry, Matthew, Mark, and, and Luke, the last chapter, the last two chapters of John, and the first chapter of the book of Acts. If you want to read about those 50 days, you can read those chapters. So we're going to look in Luke chapter 24, and we're going to begin at verse number 49. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. This is Jesus talking. But stay in the city. Now notice what he said. Stay. Stay. You remember the first week we talked about go. Jesus said, all power, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Therefore, go. But as a part of that commission, he said, before you go, you need to wait. You need to stay. You need to learn some things. Stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And when he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Now we're going to look in Acts chapter 1. A couple different passages, remember, Jesus said, go and wait in Jerusalem. So they're waiting actually at the temple, part of it they were waiting. But they also waited privately in the upper room. We're going to see this here in Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. And it says, while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Then skip down to verse number 12. And then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. That's about a little over half a mile. And when they had entered, they all, they all went up to the upper room. So they're waiting there in Jerusalem, going to the temple, and they're waiting in the upper room. This is a key thing for you to understand to learn how to wait well. They waited at the temple. They praised God daily. They worshiped God daily. And they waited in the upper room and they were praying. So they waited at the temple and they waited in the upper room. And when they went up to the upper room where they were staying, all these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. God wants you to learn how to wait well. God has a plan and a purpose for your life. We saw that in week one. We talked about Jesus brings hope and that he tells us all power, all authority is given to me in heaven and earth. Therefore, go. And as you're going, all these things he tells us to do. But before we go, we're to wait. And what does that mean? Does that mean that God wants you to wait until all conditions are perfect? No. King Solomon wrote in the book of Ecclesiastes, if you wait for perfect conditions, you'll never get anything done. We all know that to be true. There are some people that the reason they are not successful in life is because they aim and 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 they aim some more and they aim some more and they never pull the trigger. So God doesn't want you to be indecisive. He doesn't want you to be that way. But before you go, you got to wait. 
You got to learn to wait. And so what does God teach us through waiting? Here's the thing I know, that if you don't learn to wait well, you're going to delay the promise of God. Once again, Jesus was on earth 40 days. The disciples, after he ascended back to heaven, waited 10 days. And had they not waited for the promise of the Holy Spirit, they would have delayed the promise and the plan and the purpose of God in their life. It was through the power of the Holy Spirit that they were able to see on that first day that the church started, 3,000 people get saved and baptized. They wouldn't have done that if they said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to set up a revival meeting, and we're going to get the most popular singers around to come, and we're going to really have us a crusade. They wouldn't have received the promise of God. It would have been delayed. They would not have impacted the world the way they did in such a short period of time where the entire world heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. They would have delayed the promise of God. And I believe that so often that because we don't learn to wait well on the promise of God in our life, we delay the purpose and the plan of God in our life. So what does God teach us by waiting? Well, I think there's three things. The first thing he teaches us is the importance of relationships. The importance of relationships. As I told you, they waited in the temple and in the upper room. So what is the principle? Jesus told them to wait. They waited in the temple. What does that represent? Public worship. They waited in the temple, public worship, and they waited in the upper room. What is that? A relationship with the people of God. How do you get a relationship with the people of God? Through coming to church, but it's not enough just to come to the public worship. It's not enough just to show up and sit in the back and kind of hide out and not speak to anybody, hope nobody recognizes you, hope nobody asks you to do anything. But when we begin to serve, when we begin to live as if church was not about me, but about others, when we begin to serve, we begin to discover something incredible that will change our life. They waited in the temple and in the upper room. So what does that mean? Here's the principle. I want you to get it. When you are having to wait, you need to wait in relationship with God's people and with God's presence. You need to learn to wait in relationship with God and in relationship with God's people. You say, Pastor, what are you talking about this? I don't ever want you ever to leave here and go, man, that was awesome. I wonder what he was talking about. I want you to hear me clearly and very simply. You need, in the times of waiting, you need the public worship. I, I want to challenge those of you online because you have in our online community, chosen to be a part of our church. And for many of you, this is the only option that you have. And we thank God that you have this option. And we want to challenge you to learn how to wait in relationship with God on the online community, but also in relationship with God's people. For those of you that are online, it's going to be a little more challenging because uh, you may not have those interpersonal relationships and you have to seek them out, maybe in your neighborhood or at your work, but you can do it. But I want you to hear me. You must learn to wait in relationship with God, worshiping God publicly and in relationship with God's people. What are ways you can do that? Well, obviously by worshiping God every Sunday, by coming to church, by hearing the teaching of the word of God, and when I am in relationship with God's people, you do that through serving, being on a serving team, being in a small group. There are so many ways that you can be in relationship with God's people. But here's what I know, that when you're waiting, and by the way, waiting can be very lonely. Waiting can be very difficult. Waiting can be very hard. But when you're waiting, you need the public worship and the private relationship with God's people. What does public worship do? Well, the Bible tells us that God promises that when you become a believer, he is going to indwell your body. The Bible tells us that your body is the temple, the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. 
So when you get saved, the Holy Spirit lives in you. But did you know the Bible also tells us that the Holy Spirit dwells in the church? The word church simply means gathering. We've kind of corrupted that word a little bit. But the the word church simply means gathering. And so the Holy Spirit is in the gathering, and he's in you. And why is it better to be in the public place? What can you get? What can you get in the public gathering that you cannot get in the private viewing or the private hearing? Well, I believe it is the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. And when you begin to live your life this way, that when you come to church and you serve or you are a part of a team or you are in a small group, you are waiting in relationship with God and in relationship with with God's people. When I am in relationship with God and his people, I wait well. Have you ever noticed that when you're waiting on something, that somebody else can encourage you and make all the difference in your life, all the difference in your attitude, all the difference in your joy? Oh, that's the way God's designed it. You see, when I'm having to wait on an answer to prayer, when I'm having to wait on something that maybe I feel like God has told me that's going to happen in my life, when I'm having to wait for an answer from God, you know where I wait the best? It's not alone, but it's in church with God's people and in relationship with God's people. So the reason that church is important is because you get the corporate worship. The reason that serving on a team or being in a small group is so important is you get the face-to-face time with God's people. And there are people there that can pray for you and encourage you and put their arm around you and help you when you're discouraged. I learned the value of relationships when I'm waiting on God, when I'm waiting well. You see, God is not punishing you by making you wait. He's growing you. Most of us need time to grow in our relationship with God before we can handle the promise anyway. Let me just give you an example. From the Old Testament, you remember the story of Abraham and Sarah. God had promised them they were going to have a son. They were in their old age, okay? The Bible says that, they, that Sarah was already past normal childbearing years, and that Abraham it says he was an old man and wasn't able to father children. What's funny is after Sarah died, he was well over 100 years old. He had a bunch of other kids. He got remarried and had a bunch of other kids. So uh, the fact is, uh, Abraham wasn't quite as bad off as he thought he was, but they had been told by God, they had no children, that they were going to have a son, and through him was going to come the promise of a Savior that would be the Savior for the world. And do you know when that happened? Not until they were 100 years old, Abraham was 100 years old, and Sarah was 90, I believe, and they waited, listen, for 25 years. 25 years. Can you imagine that? And the Bible tells us in the book of Romans that Abraham, the reason his faith was so great is he just believed that God was going to keep his promise. But we know that they weren't quite ready because, oh, some years into this, uh, Sarah got tired of waiting on God's promise, and she said to Abraham, her husband, she said, here, take my handmaid, Hagar, and you go into her, and you have a baby with her, and that'll be the way that God answers our prayer. And of course, we know that that was not God's will. That caused them lots and lots of problems, and whenever we get ahead of God, it always causes us problems. But you know one reason why they had to wait that long? It was because they weren't ready yet. They had some growing in their relationship to do. We learned the value of relationships in waiting. Here's the next thing we learned. We learned the importance of preparation. God wants to prepare you for some things. And sometimes... It is the pain of what you experience that it prepares you for the breakthrough that God has for your life. Now, I realize that the pain is never fun. Waiting is never fun. But God has not left you alone to suffer. He is preparing you for something that he has 
for your life. He's preparing you. Let me read to you from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 28 to 31. It's one of my favorite passages of Scripture. And Isaiah writes, he says, Have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. If in case you're wondering, he said, have you not heard, God is God. God is in charge. God is all-powerful. God is the creator. He does not faint or grow weary. Aren't you glad for that? Aren't you glad that God doesn't ever get tired of you coming to him? Aren't you glad? Listen, I've heard people say before, well, I can't go to God about that. He's too busy running the universe to listen to me. Well, the problem with that is that is exactly the opposite of what Scripture teaches us. It tells us to go to God about everything. He says that his understanding is unsearchable. In other words, unknowable. He gives power to the faint. And to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord... Let me read that again. They who wait for the Lord. Let me read that one more time. They who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. You want to be able to have strength for your journey? Learn to wait on the Lord. You want to be able to mount up with wings like eagles? Learn to wait on the Lord. There are a few things that waiting on God prepares us to do. Uh, It prepares us for. uh, Waiting, number one, gives you strength. God promises that when you wait well on him, when you wait in faith on him, he will renew your strength. There's some of you that you're like, you know what? I'm about to suffer burnout. I hear that a lot of times from people. And God promises that if you'll wait on him, don't do anything rash. Don't decide you're going to quit. Don't decide you're going to bail out. But you wait on the Lord, and he promises to renew your strength. I cannot tell you the numbers of times that I've wanted to quit. You say, oh, pastor, I can't believe you ever want to quit. Oh, just about every Monday. But you know what I've learned that in waiting that God always renews my strength. That he always gives me endurance. That he always is with me and he'll always keep me in the game. Waiting gives you strength. Waiting gives you perspective. He said you'll mount up with wings as eagles. I don't know if you know this about eagles, but they say that an eagle can see a mouse from one mile in the sky. You know what an eagle has that you and I don't have? They have perspective. They can see things that we cannot see because they soar high above everything else. You know what God wants to do with you? He wants to give you perspective. You see, oftentimes the reason we're upset or the reason we're angry is we don't have perspective. I'll just give you an example. My dad, when I was a little boy, um, I began to run, and I always used to like to go outside when he was doing yard work, and uh, he, uh, I saw him coming toward me, and we lived right on the road, and across the road was where my grandmother lived, and we lived on this curve, and oftentimes people would go through that area very, very fast in their cars, and I, I saw my dad coming toward me, and I decided that I was going to run from him, and I began to run, and I was planning on running across the road to my grandma's yard and I was running with everything in me and I saw my dad I kind of looked back and he was yelling at me and he was sprinting as fast as he could go and I just thought he was playing a game so I ran even harder and right before I got run over by the car that was coming around the curve at a high rate of speed my dad scooped me up in his arms and took me safely to the other side you know what I didn't have that my dad did I didn't have perspective I couldn't see the car coming he could do you know what you and I need God can see things that we cannot see 
And when we trust him, you know what he does? He gives us perspective. Perspective. And that's what God wants for you. Waiting gives you endurance. He said, they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. God wants you to have endurance. And then waiting helps you pray. In Acts, they prayed while they waited. And I want to challenge you that while you're waiting on the answer, while you're waiting on the promise, while you're waiting on the decision, pray. Don't just pray alone. Pray with somebody else. The interesting thing about what they did in Acts was they prayed together. Don't bear that burden alone. Get a friend to pray with you. Get someone in your small group to pray with you. Get someone on your serving team to pray with you. God wants us to learn to pray. And here's the final thing. He teaches us the importance of trust. He shows us how important relationships are. Relationship with God and relationship with God's people. Then he teaches us the importance of preparation. We've got to prepare if we're going to receive the promise. But then he shows us how important it is to trust. In other words, to have faith. You know that in the Bible, faith is not like what some of us think the word faith means. For many of us, we think that faith is just simply hoping that things work out. But did you know that in the Bible, faith always has an object? It's not just a feeling. And it's not just hoping based against all odds that things work out to your favor. Do you know what faith is in the Bible? It always has as its object God the Father and Jesus Christ. And so when we say that we have trust, it means that we're trusting God. It means that we're trusting Jesus. And i got to be honest with you, there have been many times in my life that I had to trust God because it seemed like that Man, things were not going to work out. Same is true in the Bible. Did you know that God's timing is always perfect? I'll just give you an example. Uh, the timing was perfect for Jacob and Rachel. You know the story from the Old Testament, the book of Genesis, about Jacob and Rachel. You know, it was Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob and Esau, okay? Uh, they were twin brothers. But Jacob became the one that God blessed. And uh, through him, he had 12 sons. And um, one of those sons' names was Joseph. Joseph. Now, if you don't know the backstory, you don't know how important this story is. The backstory was that uh, Jacob loved, and I mean loved, Rachel. In fact, he went, and back in those days, I guess this was more common, back in those days, he told her father, he was willing to work for her for seven years. And of course, Laban, his father-in-law, tricked him and gave him her older sister, Leah. And the Bible says that Rachel was beautiful, but it said Leah was tender-eyed. I guess that's just kind of like saying, bless your heart when you're from the South. Would you look at her, bless her heart? You know what that means? That means you ugly. That's what that means. U-G-L-Y, you ain't got no alibi. You ugly. That's what that means. Okay? And so imagine his surprise when he woke up the next morning. And he's like, oh, my goodness. Leah, what are you doing in my tent? But he had to wait on Rachel. And after they got married man did he want to have a baby with her because he loved her he loved her and she wanted to have a baby but her older sister was having children she was popping them out I mean and I mean everybody in that family was popping them out everybody but Rachel and especially in that culture that was considered a curse from God and they couldn't figure it out And finally, one day, God answered their prayer, and the 11th son was born. His name was Joseph. And when Joseph was a teenager, he began to dream dreams. He dreamed about that uh, there were these sheaves and that they all bowed down and worshipped him. The sun, moon, and stars bowed down and worshipped him. And he had this dream, and his brothers became very jealous. In fact, his father had given him the coat of many colors, And that was 
in that culture, you gave the heir, the oldest son, the coat of many colors. He was to be the ruler of the clan, the ruler of the family. And you never gave that to the 11th son. You didn't give it to the second son, much less the, the 11th son. But uh, Jacob had given that to Joseph, and he was born. And when he was a teenager, listen to this, when he was a teenager, his brothers were jealous of him, and they threw him in a pit, and they sold him to the Ishmaelites, and he became an Egyptian slave. And I won't go through the whole story, but he was falsely accused. And when he was 30 years old, he was about 17 when this happened. When he was 30 years old, 30 years old. He had been in prison for all, nearly all this time. God brought him in. and Pharaoh had a dream and he didn't know what it meant. And he brought Joseph in and he interpreted the dream. And literally Joseph became the prime minister, if that wasn't really the real position back then, but be the equivalent of it today. He became the prime minister of Egypt and God, because he said there's going to be seven years of plenty and then there's going to be seven years of famine, God literally used Joseph to save the world. That is no exaggeration. He literally saved the world. But it wouldn't have happened if Jacob and Rachel got their answers to their prayers when they wanted them. If they had not learned to wait, Joseph would never have been in that position to be able to save the world. And here's my point. Sometimes we don't see what we want right away, but God's having us to wait for a reason because he wants us to learn the power of trust. God's timing is always perfect. Kim and I, in our own life, before we started this church, I was in evangelism and uh, we wanted to sell our house and move to Dallas, Texas. That's what I felt like was God's will. And we put our house up for sale. This was a good time to sell a house at that time. And not only did we not get anybody to make an offer on the house, we didn't have a single person come and look at the house. Not one, not a phone call, not any interest. I was so discouraged. I was just so convinced that I was doing what God wanted me to do. And I was so disappointed that God didn't let us move to Dallas, Texas. In less than six months after we did not sell our house, God revealed to us that it was our job, our calling, our mission, our purpose to start Avalon Church. And all I can say is this, Lamentations 326, it is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. I don't know what it is that God's having you wait on, but I do know this. He wants you to learn the value of relationships, worshiping God, being in relationship with God's people. He, he wants you to, to learn how to prepare, and he wants you to learn to trust him. And when you do, I believe God's timing is always perfect. And he will always, always, always get the glory if we'll let him. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help all of us today. Help us to trust you. Help us to wait on you. Help us to wait well. Lord, for those that are seeking the answers, those that are uh, searching for meaning, those that are searching for your purpose, I pray that you'd be with them and bless them. Now, before I finish my prayer, I wonder, first of all, what is God speaking to you about today? No one looking but me. And you say, Pastor, God has spoke to me about waiting on him, waiting well, maybe about my patience, maybe about something I'm praying about. But I want you to pray for me today because God has spoken to me and I want to do what God's leading me to do, what God's speaking to me about. Would you just raise your hand? Anybody like that in the room? Lots of people. Lots of people. <clears throat> Father, I pray that you bless each and every person. Show them how to wait. How to wait well. And then before we finish our prayer, I wonder who would say, Pastor, I need to be saved today. 
I need Jesus as my Savior. I'm not sure of my salvation, but I'd like to be. I want you to say something like this to God. You don't have to say it out loud. You can say it in your heart. Dear God, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he died on the cross for my sins and that he rose from the grave. And I'm asking you to save me right now. Come into my life, change me and forgive me. In Jesus' name. I want you, if you just now prayed that prayer in the room, I wonder if you would say, Pastor, I prayed that prayer to be saved today with you. Would you raise your hand high enough and long enough for me to see it? Anybody in the room today? Anybody in the room today? I don't see any hands. Those of you online today, I want you to hit the button at the bottom of your screen to let us know that you prayed to receive Christ today so that we can help you take a next step and that we can follow up with you as well. Heavenly Father, help us to wait well on you. Help us to follow you with all of our heart. And God, we want you to know that we love you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.